twice since becoming an MD have I found myself on vacation and called into action. The first time happened on a transatlantic flight the day after graduation. I was going to the World Cup. Halfway in, I looked up from my magazine, Sky Mall, and saw a small congregation 20 aisles ahead. A voice came on the overhead. If anyone's a doctor, could you please identify yourself by pressing the attendant call button? This seriously happened. <laughs> my first thought was, wait, someone else must be a doctor. <laughs> Another couple of seconds passed and I started to think how I might explain myself to the flight attendant. Excuse me, kind ma'am, I'd say, but I literally became a doctor yesterday. <laughs> what this means is, I don't know what I'm doing. Yes, it's true, technically I'm a doctor, but if you want to know the truth, I'm done with medicine. I'm off to become a writer. Right after this World Cup is done, I'm moving on with my life. In that post-announcement hush, the synapses in my hippocampus and frontal lobe attempted to reaccess some really important data, much of it acronyms. In case of shock, ABC, airway, breathing, circulation, heart attack, MONA, morphine, oxygen, nitrate, aspirin. Very quickly, I started to rue every second I'd spent not memorizing the pharmacology textbook. Biochem, why have you abandoned me? <laughs> then came a sound, one that echoed through the cabin. Ding! The sound of salvation. Someone 10 rows ahead ringing the call attendant button. I tried to save face. Once the dust settled, I pressed the button. <laughs> I too am into medicine, is how I think I phrased it. It's okay, said the flight attendant. He was dizzy and we found someone else. Days later, I witnessed Team USA lose three nothing to the Czech Republic. The next year, after my first stab at a novel failed to lift off, I returned to medicine as an intern. One of my very first patients began coughing uncontrollably at night. The doctors in the ER had told us the lady was having chest pain, and so we began treating her for a possible heart attack. I was the most inexperienced hand on deck, the only hand, as a matter of fact, since the other doctor, the upper level resident, was busy seeing patients in the ER. I did what any intern worth his salt might do. I triple paged to the upper level. <laughs> I also ordered a chest x-ray and read the woman's chart. I can't breathe in. Those were the exact words she'd said in the emergency room. Even though I'd noticed her breathlessness, I had started my own interview with her following the ER doctor's lead. Are you having chest pain? When the upper level returned, we reviewed the chest x-ray. Look at this, he said, pointing out spots that should have been black. There was fluid in the lady's lungs everywhere. She wasn't having a heart attack. She was having something different, congestive heart failure. The upper level shook his head. We need to give her Lasix to pee out this fluid. And sure enough, the next morning on rounds, she grabbed the wrist of my boss, the chief of cardiology at Ben Taub, a tall, dark, elegantly dressed man, one admired by all the nurses, and inhaled deeply. That's a fine perfume, she said. <laughs> There's no doubt that clinical experiences as such influence a doctor's behavior. You see a patient in the throes of illness, you administer a medication, you see a result that resolves the symptoms. Lasix for congestive heart failure is reinforced. That's how we learn as doctors, why we have an apprenticeship called residency. But I don't think that's enough. Whenever I think about my first treatment of acute congestive heart failure, I think about how preventable that moment of coughing and breathlessness was. I think about how ill-prepared all the doctors were, me included, for those exact words she gave us, I can't breathe in. I think about how that night I succumbed to something called chart bias, a tendency in doctors to confirm the diagnoses of other doctors. Why hadn't we pictured in our minds what could be causing her to feel breathless? Why, instead of using her words, did we assign our term, chest pain? I think maybe if we had read the stories better, the story of congestive heart failure, the story of this woman that couldn't breathe in, she wouldn't have had to become a teaching moment for me. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. 
I think doctors can improve the care they give their patients if they grasp stories better. Correspondingly, I think we should educate our doctors like this. We should teach pre-meds, medical students, residents, and young doctors to recognize stories better, to be able to read them better, to be able to tell them better, and ultimately, to be able to use them better. <coughs> I focus on those at the beginning of their careers because I know how overwhelming the road to becoming a doctor can seem. Genetics, anatomy, add to this all that society wants from doctors. Good bedside manner, knowing how much tests cost. And it starts to seem like you might never please your patients. We train young doctors to absorb data well, but don't give them the right tools to process this data into a larger picture and to communicate it back to the patient. This is how I think stories can help young doctors. To understand this better, let's go back to the lady coughing in the middle of the night. This is how to evaluate and treat chest pain according to the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement. A very similar algorithm was utilized when the lady I told you about entered the emergency room. Even though the lady said, I can't breathe in, doctors heard chest pain, since this is a symptom often associated with shortness of breath. There's a term I have for this type of practice, algorithmania. The story of this lady's illness began with, I can't breathe in, and our attempt to categorize her led us down the wrong path. What doctors should ask themselves is, who in this algorithm is the protagonist? Without stories to guide us, patients become problems we solve instead of heroes we help. How are you becomes tell me your symptoms. I'm concerned becomes prognosis is poor. We've all experienced this, whether for a flu shot, talking with a therapist, or in my case, visiting the ER after completely wiping out on a run around rice. I, I blame the trail. <laughs> Lab results, referrals, billing, WebMD, this is the modern experience of illness. Where do doctors fit into this? Are we the patient's allies? Or are we, as Arthur Frank puts it, spokespersons for the disease? What we need are storytellers to help guide us through these complex waters of language and algorithms to show us the experiences surrounding illness and not just the science of what's occurring. The story of congestive heart failure isn't only about the heart petering out, it's also the difficulty a woman from Louisiana might find in avoiding salt in her diet. Where does she shop? Who does she eat meals with? Does she read nutrition labels? Can she read? When I think about this woman's story, I enter a new space where she is the protagonist, not me. I am not the disease's spokesperson, but a gondolier navigating Venice's canals. I have expertise. I've taken these paths with others before, but I've never maneuvered quite like this. Not with this tide. Never for this person. Medicine's language is a powerful one, one that can evoke fear and wonder, confusion, even rapture. We don't realize it, but we can use this language to invade the patient's story. My, doc, my dad, who's also a doctor, once gave the news to my sister that her beagle had expired, had died. He told her, I'm sorry to tell you, Pringa has expired. I too felt the temptation to use jargon when communicating, for the first time, the death of a patient. Ma'am, I wanted to let you know that your father, Mr. Alvarez, I started, the words metastatic and perforation floating through my head, well, he passed. Leukemia, curative, copay, C-section. What sort of complex emotions does the phrase currently in remission arouse? The world has changed since penicillin. Our language is proof of this. Between the ages of two and four, the language centers in our brains undergo a large growth spurt. We start absorbing words from all around us. Our physical experience with the world as two-year-olds, however, is limited. And so we're left with an unbalance. We have too many words to match our experience. One of the ways we deal with this unbalance is to create experiences, sometimes in the form of imaginary friends. This was the case of a young girl named Ella and her friend Mingus in Alexander Heeman's essay, The Aquarium. Mingus arrives at a harrowing time for the Hemans. Ella's little nine-month-old sister has been diagnosed with a rare brain cancer one for which she receives multiple surgeries and chemotherapies. Ella 
processes her sister's illness through the imaginary Mingus. Sometimes he has a fever, and sometimes he's the doctor, and sometimes he's on vacation, and sometimes he just drops in at dinner, dinner time, cured of all illness. Ella's utilizing Mingus' stories the same way her father uses his character stories, as a means of understanding the difficult world surrounding her. Listening to Ella furiously and endlessly unfurl the Mingus tales, writes Hemin, I understood that the need to tell stories was deeply embedded in our minds and inseparably entangled with the mechanisms that generate and absorb language. Narrative imagination, and therefore fiction, was a basic evolutionary tool of survival. I think young doctors are like little Ellas. We're thrown into a difficult world filled with complex words, and our experiences don't match the words. We've memorized the precise mechanism of diabetic ketoacidosis, but we haven't smelled the sweet breath of someone in its throes. Stories give us the space to process these new words. As I say this, I feel my medical education jabbing inside me in the manner of a student that really, really, really knows the answer to a teacher's question. Okay, it says, the theory is nice, but where's the evidence? How do we really know that proficiency in stories helps us take better care of patients? Up until a year ago, I might have said, evidence, shm evidence, this stuff is obvious. But come to think about it, that's the way medicine has worked since antiquity. The way we accepted bloodletting and cupping, even arthroscopic knee surgeries for arthritis. These treatments made sense given certain ideas. The body is composed of humors, or surgery depressurizes the joint space. But one of the reasons we trust modern medicine is that we hold it up to the standards of empirical science. Let's make sure this actually works. I'll admit, the evidence that stories help in patient care isn't bulletproof, but it's a start. And it appeared in the esteemed journal Science, as well as on the New York Times homepage. The study found that subjects who read literary fiction were able to recognize complex emotions on human faces much better than those that read nonfiction, grocery store fiction, and those that didn't read at all. Researchers theorized that these kind of stories changed the way that study participants thought by forcing them to read the mind of characters. The reason this study turned so many heads was that it implied that reading well-written stories helped build empathy skills. This idea, teaching doctors to empathize, is modern medicine's Higgs boson. How do we keep our doctors competent and simultaneously empathetic? It makes sense, right? If reading stories helps you read emotions on people's faces, then maybe you'll care more about these emotions. Here's again where my experiences as a young doctor beg me to stop. Because in medicine, when we hear the word empathy, we think caring. When people complain that doctors don't empathize enough, we he what we hear is that people think we don't care enough. This we take personally because we remember the night calls, the stress, the studying, the hours at the bedside. What do you mean I don't care enough? But caring is only part of empathy. Emotion is only part of stories. Empathy is as much a mental process as it is an emotional outpouring. As the chemotherapies and surgeries take their toll on Ella's little sister, Mingus' life takes on new, complex dimensions. He starts spiking fevers. He requires medicines. His tumor worsens. Using Mingus, Ella dives into her sister's suffering. M, into, patheia, feeling, empathy. Once the worst comes to pass and Ella's sister dies, Mingus doesn't die, he lives on. He meets a girl and starts a family. He learns how to play chess. When the humans go skiing, he insists on snowboarding. This is because Ella's imagining as much as feeling her sister's loss. This is the, this is the essence of empathy, using your brain to extend yourself into someone else's story, not just feeling. I can't help but think that the vast narrative space Mingus has carved out for himself might be a clue to us providers for how to deal with burnout. Stories have the power to absorb our daily tragedies, the way that menisci absorb the pounding on our knees, the way that Mingus absorbs Ella's sadness. I've often thought that empathy's enemy is the touchy-feely, 
This idea that we should cry with all our patients, or hold all their hands, or speak to all in soft terms. Stories tell us there's no one way of responding. We should be able to recognize what patients need more emotion, and what patients need more numbers, or time, or less time, or small talk about the Super Bowl, or thorough explanations of risks and benefits. Recognizing individuality, whether on a face or in a patient's history, this is the clinical value of empathy and what we gain from stories. The second time I found myself on vacation and called to action, I was ready. It happened a couple months ago in a Mexican town named San Miguel de Allende. I learned that the owner of the hotel where we were staying couldn't go upstairs like he used to. He was coughing a lot. His employees were worried. They somehow found out I was a doctor. I promise you, I wasn't wearing scrubs, which was why they called me. Sure, I had all the experiences in the hospital to fall back on, all the data I'd studied, but I'd also dedicated myself over the last 10 years to stories. So when he told me, it feels like my heart has trouble pumping blood to my lungs, I didn't try to fit his words into an algorithm for shortness of breath. I imagined the story of the heart as a pump. I envisioned how blood moves from the right ventricle to the lungs to pick up oxygen. I also thought about his story a 75-year-old Harvard-educated architect that animatedly imitated animal sounds and restored as many old buildings as he could. What would it take to slow this guy down? I listened to the diagnosis given to him by the cardiologist that an arrhythmia had caused his symptoms, and I told myself, the story doesn't make sense. I had no stethoscope on me, but I had my ears. And anyways, I was only listening for the snap, crackle, pop that fluid makes inside lungs. I stood up and lifted the back of his shirt, placed my ear in the middle of his back. Breathe in, I told him, now breathe out. And there it was. I had a pretty convincing diagnosis. It needed to be confirmed with tests, but at least I could explain to him what I was thinking and allay some of his fears. You know how you said it was hard for your heart to pump blood to your lungs, I said, envisioning what pulmonary hypertension looks like, and then I really got started. Here's what's so unique about your story. Thank you.